Welcome to Tiny Epics. This episode features Hephaestus, Greek god of the forge who was brutally kicked out of Mount Olympus, only to later return and claim his rightful spot among the other Olympian gods. Among the many phenomenal creations he produced as blacksmith to the gods, he also developed artificially intelligent robots, believe it or not. We'll explore all that later in this episode, so be sure to stay tuned. But first, we have some very important groundwork to cover. Let's start at the beginning. The origin story of Hephaestus is very messed up. At least according to one version that goes like this. Hera, the proud queen of the gods, gave birth to Hephaestus all by herself without any help from her husband Zeus. The process is called parthenogenesis. It's a form of asexual reproduction in which an embryo spontaneously develops from an unfertilized egg cell. It's a Greek word combining parthenos, meaning virgin, and genesis, meaning creation. It is impossible with humans, of course, but that doesn't stop the gods from doing it. Just like Hephaestus, the goddess Athena was also the result of a virgin birth, as she sprung fully formed directly from the head of her father Zeus. In many artworks that depict the scene, you'll notice Hephaestus standing nearby, this is because in some versions of his myth, he was the one who split Zeus's head open with his axe to set the goddess free. Most of the other Olympian gods were present and witnessed the miraculous event in absolute awe. On the day Hephaestus is born, however, there was nothing awesome about it. Hera tells the other gods on Mount Olympus how repulsed she is by her newborn son Hephaestus, who appears small and weak for a god and who has a shriveled foot. On top of that, she's bitterly jealous that her husband Zeus conceived of bright-eyed Athena without her, who Hera considered far superior to her own child. She takes one look at her infant son Hephaestus, calls him a shame and a disgrace, then promptly hurls him over the summit of Mount Olympus to fall into the great sea. It should be mentioned that other poets describe Hera as a sweet, protective mother, and Zeus as the one who hurls a fully grown Hephaestus from Mount Olympus during a domestic dispute in which Hephaestus tried to defend his mother. It's said that he fell for an entire day, resulting in permanent injury to his leg, this is the other explanation for why he's sometimes called the limping god. Most stories say that after his fall, Hephaestus ended up on the island of Lemnos, where he was cared for by the locals and taught to be a master craftsman. Others say that the sea nymph named Thetis took him in and became his adoptive mother. One myth also says that Hephaestus got revenge on his cruel mother in a very unique way. He crafted for her a most magnificent golden throne and had it delivered to her palace on Mount Olympus. He knew that just such a thing would certainly appeal to her vanity, but this was no ordinary gift. You see, Hephaestus had built within the throne secret compartments that would become triggered when Hera sat down. Finally, she thought, a throne worthy of my greatness. The moment she sat down upon it, mechanical shackles automatically shot out from the arms of the throne and caught her by her lovely wrists. She soon realized she was completely trapped and cried out for help. Alarmed by the shrieks, the other Olympian gods came out of their palaces to see what was going on. She screamed at them, ordering them to find out who the culprit was and to have him brought to her. They agreed, all the while trying to suppress their grins at seeing this proud peacock of a goddess completely subdued. When it was discovered that Hephaestus had made it, the gods begged him to come and set her free. You see, they could no longer take the harpy-like cries that issued forth non-stop from Hera on Mount Olympus. She was driving everyone insane. Hephaestus coldly refused, saying, I have no mother. 
Dionysus, the god of wine, came up with a plan. He visited Hephaestus' workshop on Lemnos, got him completely drunk, and took him back to Olympus on the back of a donkey, accompanied by his revelers. It's a scene that shows up in ancient Greek art known as the Return of Hephaestus. According to one story, Zeus promised anything to Hephaestus in order to free his screaming wife. Hephaestus thought about it and decided there was something he'd like, and that was Aphrodite, the most beautiful goddess of all, as his bride. Zeus, out of options at this point and desperate for a solution, reluctantly shook hands with Hephaestus to seal the deal. So Hephaestus left Lemnos for the shining summit of Mount Olympus, where he married Aphrodite and built for them both a spectacular palace and a workshop next door for himself. It wasn't long into the marriage until Aphrodite had an affair with Ares, god of war. Seeing that gossip on Mount Olympus travels as swiftly as Hermes' winged sandals, Hephaestus soon found out what all the other Olympians already knew. He was utterly humiliated, but when he got over feeling sorry for himself, he realized how angry he was. How could she treat me like this, he thought. How dare she make a fool of me? She's mine. Zeus gave her to me. As he toiled away like a demon in his Olympian workshop to try and force the picture of his beautiful wife and that loser Ares out of his mind, an idea suddenly came to him like one of Zeus's thunderbolts. He'd been working on a golden girdle for his wife's birthday, but decided to put the fine material to far better use. With it, he crafted a net so finely worked that it was as light as a feather but strong as steel at the same time. A few days later, Aphrodite appeared in her husband's workshop looking even more radiant than usual, if that was even possible. She mentioned she'd be away for a little while on some errands, kissed Hephaestus on the cheek, summoned her dove-drawn chariot, and was off. He might not be all-seeing Zeus, but he wasn't an idiot either. He knew she was sneaking away to see him, that good-for-nothing, war-mongering pretty boy. He hopped onto one of his silent flying scooters he'd designed and was fast on her heels. As Ares began to put his hands on his wife, Hephaestus snuck up and ensnared them both beneath the unbreakable net. So it's true, he said, unable to hide the heartbreak in his voice. They realized they'd been caught and tried to flee, but to their horror, saw that they couldn't escape. The net closed in tightly on them both until they were locked together in a very uncomfortable embrace. He carried them up to the top of Mount Olympus and dumped his unfaithful wife and her lover onto the throne room floor right in front of the other gods. His hope had been to humiliate Aphrodite and Ares the way they'd humiliated him. As Hephaestus walked away, he heard the audience of the other Olympian gods erupt into wild fits of laughter. Before his move to Mount Olympus, the famed workshop of Hephaestus was often thought to be located beneath a volcano, and he was said to be aided by the mighty one-eyed giants known as the Cyclopes. The ancient Roman name for Hephaestus was Vulcan, by the way, which is, incidentally, where we get the word volcano. Although the underdog who wasn't physically perfect like the other gods, Hephaestus showed his strength through his phenomenal creativity. He was, after all, responsible for the invention of just about every unique or sophisticated machine or piece of tech that shows up in Greek mythology. We see him here on this ancient red figure style drinking cup, his hammer in one hand and, in the other, the helmet he's just forged for Achilles. Hephaestus hands it to Achilles' mother, the goddess known as Thetis, who then presents it to her warrior son to wear into battle during the Trojan War. And yes, this is the same nymph who rescued Hephaestus from the sea as an infant. He also designed Hermes' winged helmet, which was famously loaned to the hero Perseus to help him slay Medusa, along with some stylish winged sandals to complete the look. The mighty Aegis, either shown as a shield or a breastplate, and which was used in battle by both Zeus and Athena, was also the work of Hephaestus. The head of Medusa was later offered up to Athena by Perseus, who added it to its center. A historian of science named Adrian Mayer said that, Our ability to imagine artificial intelligence goes back to ancient times. 
Long before technological advances made self-moving devices possible, ideas about creating artificial life and robots were explored in ancient myths. Just listen to this passage from Homer's Iliad, in which he describes the advanced robotic servants which Hephaestus constructed. They are golden and in appearance like living young women. There is intelligence in their hearts, and there is speech in them and strength, and from the immortal gods they have learned how to do things. Sounds to me a lot like artificial intelligence, and it was composed well over two and a half thousand years ago. In some ways, Hephaestus resembles the stereotype of the mad scientist with his innovative and often rather uncanny creations. The most renowned creation by Hephaestus, his ultimate masterwork, was the first human woman which Zeus commissioned him to create. I'm sure you've heard of her before. Her name was Pandora, and that little box she opened caused quite some drama for mankind, as it was said to have released all the evils of humanity into the world. Although later versions of the story depict Pandora as a naive young woman who unknowingly opened a box of evil, the original version from the poet Hesiod described Pandora as an artificial evil woman built by Hephaestus and sent to Earth on the orders of Zeus to punish humans for discovering fire. It could be argued that Pandora was a kind of AI agent and that her only mission was to infiltrate the human world and release her jar of miseries, historian Adrian Mayer said. Ironically, the name Pandora means gift of all. The famous myth is a kind of cautionary tale in which a present that seems to be valuable is, in reality, a curse. In many ways, like our own technology today, the artificial intelligence will evolve to the point where they will truly be our friends. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> but there are certain upsides to technological achievements too. After all, the so-called limping god Hephaestus built for himself the world's very first automated wheelchair with which to move around, helping to support his mobility and at the same time showing off his amazing skills to the other gods. Maybe you've heard the word automaton to describe certain kinds of machines or robots. Well, those clever ancient Greeks came up with it to describe the inventions of Hephaestus. The word automaton literally means acting of itself. It can also be used in a derogative way to refer to people who seem robotic, like meat puppets, generally unable to think for themselves. Greek mythology was so ahead of its time in so many ways, and I think its tales cause us to ask a lot of questions about our lives and the world around us. At least, I hope so. Well, that wraps up my introduction to Hephaestus. I hope you enjoyed what I put together for you. If you did, make sure to smash that like button for me. We'll get into many more myths in future videos, so if you'd like to be among the first to see them, please take a moment and subscribe to the channel and turn the bell notifications on. Until then, there are plenty of other gods and goddesses to explore in my Greek mythology playlist. As always, thank you so much for watching. Take care and stay epic.